All right. So yeah, talking about reg tables, um, I want to create some wizard drills and I want to study them all basically. Um, three handed is often what you will play if you sit at a reg table. Um, it's basically like, you know, on poker stars especially, it's how the the politics work. Uh, two people can sit at a table, one can sit out, one can sit in, and then if a third person joins, you got to play. Um, and so, I want to look at and study three handed. I think not only is this going to be good for poker stars reg tables, but I think it's going to be good for just becoming a better six max player in general because you'll be really good at all of the most common scenarios so it just it makes perfect sense to uh to really focus on this so let's uh let's jump into our strategy and what it's going to look like So for GTA Wizard, I'm going to use the general strat. At this point, I'm just so comfortable with it. I've studied it long enough and adapted it to my, my strategy. And so I don't think there's any reason to move away from it. It's nice also that I will be playing some 500. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to be focusing mainly on that. Okay, great. All right, um, so now I always forget the name of this. What is it called when you're playing three max and you don't have the first three positions anymore? It's like, uh, and the difference between the ranges is a little, a little bit, but not significant. Forgot what it's called but yeah that effect is gonna be minor i think and not not worth me worrying about um but if people think it's bunching effect thank you so like the bunching effect um i think is minor overall honestly i i'm not entirely sure i've never looked i never had a three max sim to compare to a six max sim but um if it is significant, that might be something I have to look into. Because at reg tables, you do play three max fairly often. All right. So first of all, the button range for opening, we're very familiar with it at this point. Um, I have this memorized to a T. Um, sometimes I mix up the, uh, the indifferent hands like jack three, 10, five, uh, five, three, jack eight, king eight, king seven, right? But overall, I'm pretty confident with, you know, memorizing this. This isn't too difficult to memorize. Uh, there's not much of a reason to, you know, dig deep into why it's opening the combos it's opening. Uh, typically, an opening range is going to be more linear. Um, it just is going to open the stronger parts of a range that it can. And that's as deep as it really goes, as far as I know. So we have button open. And then we're going to have the first scenario that we're going to look at is big blind call. Um, so big blind call, the big blind range for calling here is fairly um, condensed, I think the word is. Let me double check really quickly. There's, there's a few different morphologies that I just want to make sure I get correct before I continue here. Um, one sec, let me take a look. Uh, 
I was just looking at a GTO wizard article actually about range morphologies. Here we go. Okay, so there's um, there's linear, which is usually an opening range um, most commonly. There's polar, there's merged, and then there's condensed. So button call versus hijack open is condensed. Um, that's typically going to be what the big blinds call range looks like as well. Uh, it's going to be fairly weak condensed because it's not going to have the obvious strong three bet combos in its range when it just calls. So yeah, this is going to be a fairly condensed range. Um, it's a bit wider though than, uh, obviously the button calling range in my example. So you get a lot of weaker hands like eight, seven offsuit, 10, eight offsuit, nine, eight offsuit, king, eight offsuit, etc. cetera. Um, but the main important thing about this is that we're lacking uh, jacks and ten, actually, sorry, tens plus. Here, I'll just draw a line. It's easier. Uh, tens plus through aces, and these combos here. Um, <laughs> what a weird way of just doing this, huh? Let's do this. I'm so afraid I'm going to draw something phallic by accident. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's the um, that's the main combos that are lacking in the big blinds range so a lot of the times the board textures that come off with those combos are going to favor the button etc etc but um, looking at the big blinds range in general we're also going to look at the three betting um, the three betting range but we're going to start off with just the, the simple call and uh, we're going to take a look we're going to start with the aggregated reports the aggregated reports are i think one of the best tools for looking at a macro strategy uh, i tend to like to look at my macro strategy and then from there i delve into the more detailed uh, reports so if i want to look at what sizing am i going to use the most right um, is big blind going to lead much then that's a good um that's a good start for me to just look at right uh let me hold on i started making a three max i started making a three max uh study page over the break because this is basically what i want to do um so i looked at button versus big blind single raise pot and the first node that i looked at was the big blind leading range um, because we do have a leading range. It's very small, but it does exist on very certain textures. And so what I like to do is we'll take a look at the aggregated reports and then look at the overall strategy. How often am I checking? How often am I leading? These are the only two options I have in the big blind. So fairly simple to memorize here. A lot of people say it's really difficult to like memorize certain things but if you memorize the right things it makes things a lot easier so like instead of memorizing specific combos and specific board textures you memorize kind of certain heuristics right so like a really simple heuristic for leading the big blind in a button versus big blind scenario would be looking at the high card combos on the left here you can see the highest card is often either a six a five a seven uh or an eight in some scenarios but it doesn't really go much higher than eight high boards right like we have a couple of ace high boards with two wheel cards which is the exception to the heuristic um, and so that's what i said in here i say big blinds leading board textures with equity equity and best hands advantage which is going to typically be these six high and seven high and eight high boards um, and then ace high ww with the money sign means wheel wheel it's a shorthand for uh the program I used to use when I studied mixed games, which was Odds Oracle, uh, if any of you guys are familiar with that software. So that's how I would start, you know, accumulating notes and, and strategy for myself that I can memorize and re refer to if I ever want to relook at some of these scenarios. So big blind has the best hands advantage if button isn't playing combos like seven, four, four, two, et cetera. And that's a lot of the reason why you see these like six, five, uh, you know, 
two boards or whatever be the boards that are really good for leading six five three six five um you know five four two it's because we have a lot of the straights if we take a look in the big blinds range um you can then use the ranges tab to compare how often the button is going to have you know the best hands and the big blind is going to have the best hands so you take a look and the big blind is actually going to have more straights right here on oh wait is this a uh sorry this is not the flop i wanted to look at um we can do this and then we can do this and then we can do that there we go so looking at six five three and then looking at the ranges and then going into the best hands first of all you can see that the big blind has a best hands advantage right so this is very interesting because if you filter for all of the bet 33 at a high frequency from the big blind right so if you filter all the leading spots from the big blind um you'll see that every time we click one of these boards where there's a high frequency lead like 754 the big blind often has the best hands advantage so here's another example 754 rainbow best hands advantage looking at the 653 best hands advantage well let's click on another um you know let's scroll down let's click ace 52 is this really going to have a best hands advantage Maybe not, but it's going to have a lot of really strong hands, and that's why it wants to lead, right? So the best hands advantage is, is in favor of the button here, but it, it's really important to note the difference between the best hands isn't very large, right? Because, again, we have the 3-4, um, we have 5-2 suited, which, you know, button's not going to have. Uh, we're even going to have ace-2, uh, which is, you know, not in button's range for opening. Right? You can see here there's an absence of ace-2 offsuit. So, sorry, I made a mistake. Ace-2 is not in the big blind either. Ignore what I just said about ace-2. However, 4-3 <laughs> and 5-2, sorry, 4-3 and 5-2 are, in fact, in the big blind range and the button is not. So you guys get the idea, right? Like there's this kind of uh, pattern we're seeing with the idea that the best hands advantage is going to have a big part in leading. So I'm going to bold this. Um, as well as perhaps, you know, the equity advantage. So you can see here the equity is evenly matched 50-50. You can see here the equity is actually in favor of the big blind here. So there's some things to look out for, right? Like there's some things that are going to really indicate in the future how to think about all of the other scenarios. So just by studying button and big blind, we can start extrapolating what heuristics are important to look at when looking at other scenarios. I think the best hands advantage is very important, and that's going to cover all of these buckets here. There's also going to be some scenarios where, like, okay, they have a very high weak hands uh, advantage, or they have a lot of trash hands. Um, maybe that's going to play into something. So like using the buckets, the equity buckets is the biggest thing for me when trying to figure out the why. Figuring out the why I think is the most important thing about studying solvers. So we're taking a look at button versus big blind. We see that the, you know, the big blind has a leading range. We've now like kind of figured out why the big blind is leading on certain textures. And now we're moving on, right? So if there's no lead, which is going to be most of the time, now some players may say like, oh, you can just eliminate the leading range. It'll make your life a lot less complicated. It'll be easier to um, play the strategy. And they might very well be right. Because if you do lead, you have to know how to play against the raising against all the other stuff, as well as not leading, right? But... If you want to grow as a poker player, you kind of have to dive into this, this stuff. This is the stuff where you start really understanding game theory and you start understanding why the solver is doing what it's doing. So I always recommend, even if it's uncomfortable and very difficult to do, at least learn it. 
you don't have to use this as your strategy, but it's important to know it because there's, I guarantee you, there's going to be players that do it to you. And if you don't study it, then you're going to be left guessing anyway. So it makes sense to at least study the scenarios. All right. So we have the lead scenario um, down. Now we're going to look at the button C betting scenario. So what is it that we want to be C betting here, right? Like, do we have any idea of what we're going to be C betting? What kind of boards are good for C betting? Well, we'll play check here and then we'll look at the aggregated reports again. So now the aggregated reports have us uh, in the button and we're checking 46% of the time and betting about uh, the opposite of that, right? Minus 100 or whatever. So 53.3% of the time we're c-betting. Now, uh, we have four options in our strategy, right? We have 125, we have 50, we have 33, we have 75. Uh, right here, these are our options. Now, using four sizings is more complicated, of course, but again, they're all very important to know uh, because players are going to use it against you. Players are going to use over bets. Uh, maybe they'll simplify to 75%, so you'll have to know that. Maybe they'll simplify to a third. You'll have to know that. You'll have to understand what it means when a range doesn't have those smaller sizes too. This is what, again, a lot of players try and simplify. They try and give you one sizing for every scenario, or they try and give you two sizings, and they say the EV difference isn't that big of a deal. But what you're losing is the understanding of why we're using the small sizing and why we're mixing that small sizing with a 50% sizing. Why we're using an overbet and why are we mixing that with a 75% sizing? Why do we even have a distribution of the four different sizings if, if the solver wants to use all of them? There's a very good reason. And that's where you deep dive into the theory and understand better sizing theory. This is where you're getting all of your heuristics basically from, is looking at the solver, looking at the aggregated reports, understanding why it's using different sizings and uh, working kind of backwards in that way, right? So what does it look like uh, for the for this button right here? I've copied the, uh, the aggregated reports here for this overall strategy. We're using a small sizing, a medium sizing, a large sizing, and an overbet sizing at a high frequency. So this is one of the more difficult spots because we're using all of the different sizings. Sometimes we're not going to be using as many sizings. For example, small blind versus big blind. We don't use the overbet nearly as often. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a trickier scenario in some ways. But uh, I, I wrote it. I wrote that down. All four sizings are used. C-bet 53, right? Um, what are we overbetting? Okay, so then exact same thing I did earlier with the leading range. We take the uh, we take the aggregated reports. We simply just click on the overbet size and we look down the left side. What what boards are going to be best for overbetting? Well, it looks like we have ace king. We have ace queen. Um, those are going to be a majority of the boards because it makes the most sense that those are the combos that big blind are lacking, right? If we take a look at the range, ranges again, um, you'll see that big blind almost never has uh, ace queen and ace king. It has a little, you know, percentage of ace queen offsuit, but for the most part, absent of all these really strong ace high hands, right? Ace queen suited, ace jack suited, ace king suited, ace ace, uh, et cetera. So anytime there's an ace or queen on the board, especially together, uh, you can kind of assume that the big blind is going to have uh, a, a disadvantage, right? Um, and button is going to be able to bet at a high frequency or bet at a high sizing. It, um, it really depends on the other two cards on the board. But it looks like the ones that we want to overbet the most are going to have a combination of the cards that we have an advantage on. So there's no surprise there that on boards like, uh, you know, ace, queen, four, that's going to be a very heavy overbet scenario. So you can see the solver just wants to overbet or check at a very high frequency. And so um, that really shows this best hands advantage here for the button. So there's a big discrepancy in best hands advantage. There is an equity advantage in the favor of the button. And on top of it, this board specifically is very good for the top end of our range, right? 
it's a range that the big blind is not going to have covered. On top of that, a lot of our good hands want to be checking back. They don't want to be betting for value. They don't want to be betting for three streets. And we have a lot of good hands because two of the highest cards are on the board. So that means all of our mid-tier hands here that I just filtered for, you'll see um, you know, a pair of queens, pocket tens, pocket jacks, pocket nines, etc. They all want to check back. They don't want to bet at all. So when we have the top end of our range that wants to bet really large, that's when we want to start overbetting and getting value from these really strong hands here, right? Because these hands can possibly bet three streets. Um, it does, you know, filter some of these best hands in a check range just to have some balance as well. We can't just always bet our really strong hands, but you get the idea of how to figure out why and which combos we're using for the overbetting. So that is going to essentially be when we overbets we use the large size for all of our really good hands because we have a big advantage at the top and then we don't have nearly as many hands that want to be betting really large in the middle section and then we have a bunch of weaker hands that just want to get the showdown uh, and so that's why you get this distribution of overbetting on the the boards that are in the buttons favor Um, looking at the next thing, right? Uh, well, what boards should we check the most, right? Funny enough, ace high and king high monotone boards. Um, you would think, okay, yeah, well, we have, uh, all of the aces. Why are we checking an ace high board? Well, because it's monotone, because there's a flush out there. The stronger hands actually are now in a lot of the big blinds calling range because what happens, let's take for example. So again, I would take the aggregated reports. I would look through um, our strategy and then we would just click check. And now we can see on the left side, all of the ace high monotone boards pop up, right? So why are we checking an ace high board as the button? This doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like what's going on? Well, let's click. The way we can go through it, look through the ranges, and we can see, well, we actually have the equity advantage. We actually have the best hands advantage. Why aren't we, you know, betting at a high frequency here? The answer is because we have a ton of good hands. If you look at the good hands frequency, 42%, most of our good hands just want to check. Again, they don't want to be betting, you know, across three streets. So these monotone boards are a great example of a board that we're just going to have a lot of hands that want to go showdown. And what happens is we do a lot of checking with some strong hands as well. Uh, and if we do bet, we, we end up betting small. So you can see here, uh, the nut flush, <laughs> we're doing a lot of checking, a lot of checking. King Jack suited, uh, King Eight suited, all of these nut flushes, we're doing a ton of checking back. Um, and that's because, like I said, the medium hands, that's going to be a majority of your range and it's going to show what your other hands kind of want to do uh, and follow suit. So this is an example of not looking at just the best hands advantage, but also looking at the other buckets in the equity bucket uh, report um, and comparison. So like the equity buckets, again, important to look at the other the other categories it could even be something like your trash hands might be dictating what you want to do but uh basically in a nutshell best hands want to bet good hands want to uh pot control so you'll see a mix of like some betting good hands some checking good hands but you don't really want to be going three streets with all of your good hands uh weak hands want to usually check and then trash hands want to mix between everything because you need to have some bluffs. Usually that's where your bluffs are going to come from, from your weak and your trash hands, whether it's a flush draw or a gut shot or whatever. Those are usually in your weak or trash hands category, and those all get mixed in with some bluffing, some checking, um, and et cetera. So, yeah, hopefully that's, uh, that's fairly clear. And so moving along... Uh, 
that's a, just an example of a board that has a high frequency of check, right? So in general, you can think, well, if I have a lot of good hands, but not the best hands, maybe I should be doing a lot of checking here. Um, and then funny enough, right, we looked at the ace-queen board where we're doing a lot of overbetting, but we're doing a lot of checking too. A lot of our range checks here. And that's again, because this is a board structure that gives us a lot of medium strength hands, some good hands. Yes, we have the best hands advantage, which is why we do want to overbet if we're going to bet, but we still have a decent amount of good hands and weak hands. Um, this distribution is pretty even across the different buckets from the button. It just chooses because this board does well with the best hands to go overbet to overbet the range that it does bet. And because you're using a really large size as an overbet, you're incentivized to check the other times. You can't really put a ton of hands in your overbet range. Um, so this is a very like good example of a board that's very good, but we can't just throw in like, you know, king queen into our overbet range too. It's just not going to uh, you know, be the best option for it. Same thing with like something like ace, you know, ace three, ace two. You're not going to want to just three street value ace two, even though you have a huge equity advantage on an ace queen four board. Um, so the solver picks and chooses some of the best hands to put in the checking range, and that's why you get a lot of high frequency checks with combos like ace two. And then it pushes the more valuable ones like two pair. Even ace seven is way better than ace two for betting. So yeah. All right, moving on, um, looking at a small bet. So 33% small bet, this is going to be uh, fairly popular in the button. So we take a look at, again, the reports and filter for 33%. What kind of boards do we want to bet 33% on? Well, it looks like almost every single high card paired board there is, right? We have King King, we have Ace Ace, we have uh, 10 10. Uh, with a Broadway card, we have um, King King Six, we got Queen Queen Six, we got Jack Jack King, we got all these Broadway paired boards, and then we also have combo uh, boards like um, King Eight Three Rainbow. That's a really good board for a small sizing. Uh, and why is that, right? So then again, we're just going to look at the um, the combo that comes out from some of these board textures where a small sizing is most used. Let's look at, let's use that one that might not be so obvious, like King-8-2, right? And then we can compare it to something that is more obvious, like Ace-Ace-8. So first let's look at um, Ace-Ace-8, right? What does our range look like? Well, it looks like we have very few trash hands. That stands out to me immediately, right? We have a mixture of best hands, good hands, and weak hands, but we hardly have any trash hands. And we have a very large equity advantage, right? Um, so in scenarios where we might have a really large equity advantage and our whole range is just really doing well, uh, and we want to bet and take advantage of our advantage, then it makes sense to, to bet at a high frequency and push all of these hands that have fairly good equity, right? So I think one of the heuristics you'll see often in these bet 33 spots is a low frequency of trash hands and a high equity advantage. So now let's look at king 8 2. Same idea. Um, fairly low trash hands, uh, you know, in our bucket here. Uh, also, on the flip side, you'll see the trash hands is at a high frequency for the villain. So we'll get to that in a second, but focusing on our own stuff, uh, low, fairly low frequency trash hands, high equity advantage seems to check out. We're doing a decent amount of betting small. Let's take a look at another, another combo, king, queen, queen. So again, small trash hands, uh, fairly high equity advantage. This seems to be a fairly solid trend. And the range morphology is often going to dictate the sizing that we choose and the frequency that we choose it. 
So it's really important to get familiar with these equity buckets and understand what might be a pattern in some of the hands. And we do that by using and filtering through the report section. So this is why I spend so much time studying with the reports and studying with like um, all of the different scenarios um, is because I'm literally extracting heuristics from the solver. I'm trying to figure out what the heck the solver is doing and I'm trying to apply it so that I can then reevaluate a board texture later on. And that's what we're going to do at the end of this little like study session. Um, so we have different board textures for a third sizing. Uh, it all checks out with that similar trash hands, uh, read. And so this is what I said here, likely because of buttons, uh, range advantage range. I'll say, I'll say equity advantage with high cards and the range morphology of big blind, big blind has a lot of good and weak and trash hands. So I said, I was going to get to that. Um, looking at the flip side. A lot of the value that we're going to get from our strong hands uh, is going to come from the smaller sizing because villain doesn't really have that many strong hands to to pay off, right? Like if they have a, a big discrepancy of best hands, well, how are they supposed to call down three streets of value uh, against the button? So what happens here is a lot of the times I think the solver wants to use the 33 sizing because, um, first of all, it's going to be effective with our weak hands. Uh, villain is going to have a lot of trash hands, so they're going to be forced to fold the flop immediately at a high frequency. So right away, we have a lot of fold equity with our weaker hands. Um, and then at the top, it's really hard for us. Ooh, that was not a circle. <laughs> there we go. Oh, wow. Okay, here we go. There we go. So at the top, it's hard for us to get that three streets of value. So the solver uses the smaller sizing with the other streets and then maybe polarizes more on turn river on these paired board textures. So a way of figuring that out uh, would be just to like choose one of the trees. So like you go down the 33 uh, path and then you pick a random turn card and then you see, okay, uh, how often now are we over betting the turn? Well, we're betting large on the turn at a high frequency. We're not using that small sizing anymore, right? So we're even mixing in some over bets. So this is kind of like a good example of like, okay, yeah, they use the 33 sizing, but now look, now they're starting to size up a lot. Um, whereas some other textures that might be, you know, different range morphology, different advantages or whatever, they might start betting large early on because there are combos in, in villains range that can call down and other reasons that we already mentioned. Um, so yeah, so in terms of betting small, those paired boards, are very unique and the thing that we can extrapolate from them is that uh, we have the equity and range advantage with uh, with the high cards on the paired boards and um, button has a low amount of trash hands our or buttons Range mostly wants to bet uh, high frequency. So there you go. So low high frequency, low sizing makes a lot of sense. Uh, moving on, you know, we're, we're basically we're just going down the list of our strategy. We we covered bet thirty three. We covered over bet. Those are going to be very common scenarios, right? The most common is the small sizing. Uh, then we look at bet 50 and bet 75. So essentially for bet 50 and 75, we would just do the same exact thing, right? We would look through the range. Uh, sorry, we'd look through the reports. We would filter for which combos are most often using the 50 sizing, um, which board textures, sorry, not combos, which board textures are being used for the most uh, 50 sizing, and then go through the ranges and kind of try and break down, okay, well, what what is happening here? with this like medium size? Why are we using this medium size, right? Um, so for example, let's just do one and we'll do, we'll do one for the 50% we we'll do one for the 75%. So let's take a look at, um, you'll also notice that a lot of the shared sizings 
like a lot of the 50 and the 75 sizings share another sizing with it. So like the 50 sizing shares the 33 sizing in a lot of scenarios because it's not that much different of a sizing, right? Um, so you'll see more extreme differences in like the overbet and the, and the 33 bet. Um, and then the 50 and the 75 are going to be more of like a hybrid sizing that can kind of like balance between uh, the two sizings in certain scenarios. So oftentimes you'll see the 50 be used at a high frequency with the 33, and then you'll see the 75 be used with the 125. So you can kind of see that here, right? Like there's a decent frequency of the 33 with the 50 here. And then if you filter for the, the 75, um, the 33 starts to, to, to dwindle and now it's more of the 50 and the 75. So they kind of like bunch together in that way. The 125 is a little bit of its own beast. Um, because when you overbet, typically you're not using a lot of other sizings on the flop. Um, but the 75 and the 50 are usually kind of bunched and the 33 and the 50 are kind of bunched. So that's one thing I've noticed as well. Um, but let's look at, let's look at 522. This is a board where we do a lot of half pot betting. Oh, Franklin spilled. just fell over in his bed. Um, so looking at 50%, right? So we'll take a look. You can even do, yeah. So we'll look at the, uh, the equity buckets. And what we notice here, what, what kind of stands out to you looking at these equity buckets for the uh, the advantage between the two combos, right? Is there something that stands out here in the equity buckets for this particular board texture? It's the good hands advantage, right? You can see here that the buttons range is primarily consisting of good hands. Um, and so theoretically, it makes a lot of sense that uh, we have a lot of good hands. We want to use like a medium to good sizing, which is going to be the 50% sizing. So it's going to be a uh, another heuristic that I, I feel like I've, I've pulled from the 50% sizing. And it also kind of matches up with game theory, right? Um, if your range is going to be very polar and strong, you want to use a really large sizing. If your whole range kind of has a mix of good weak and best hands and very low trash hands uh the small sizing might be better because you have a big range advantage and your whole range wants to bet and then you have boards like this where it's like you have a mix of some of the others but mostly have good hands on this board texture so it makes sense that you would use a medium sizing um let's take a look at another board so like filter here for the 50 uh, say, let's, let's look at one of the trip boards, right? One of the three of a kind boards. That's like the perfect board to bet half on. And if I had to guess, look at that really high, good hands advantage, right? So again, looking through these like equity buckets, comparing them to some of the trends that you're finding, uh, in the different sizings and you, it starts to click in your head. Okay. This kind of board, well, maybe I would have this kind of range. And so evaluating your range in game is a little trickier than doing it in a solver, of course, but you can pull those heuristics out, right? Um, fairly simple, you know, it's easier to look at a board and say, oh, I have a best hands range on that board. It's a little tougher to be like, oh, I have a lot of good hands on this board. But there are some shortcuts that I use for like figuring that stuff out as well. Uh, that's another, another study session. But... Uh, this is basically how I would use the analyzer um, and the solutions and the ranges and the reports to figure out my strategies, uh, button versus big blind. And then I'm going to do this <laughs> for every single scenario I just listed uh, in my notepad. So it takes, it's time consuming, but I think it's effective study because it allows you to look at the macro of all of it. It allows you to understand uh, what board textures without studying every single board would be good for a small, medium, large, or overbet sizing. And that's how I also just use a more complicated four sizing strategy, 
Whereas some players are like, oh my God, I could never play a four sizing strategy. Well, there's like a method to all of it, right? And that's kind of how I broke down everything. Yeah. Okay, so what's left here? Um, the 75% sizing is very similar to, I think, the 50% sizing. So if we take a look real quick before we finish. You can filter through the 75% sizing. So you'll notice that 75% sizing isn't really a popular sizing. Um, even though it's used 8.5%, it's kind of distributed evenly over a lot of the textures. There aren't like standout boards that are really good for the 75% sizing because it's kind of like a jack of all trades sizing, very similar to the 50%. Um, but it's typically going to be used the most on the boards that are in our advantage. So a board like Queen Jack 10, um, I think we'll see a lot of the same traits of uh, having a lot of good hands, but then having that mix of some other kind of combos too. So there's a, a hand, there's a, there's a, you know, mix of weak hands in here as well. And we have a little bit of the best hands, but again, trash hands are very low. A lot of our range wants to bet the 75 sizing. A lot of our, you know, hands want to go large for value. And then we have some weak hands in there that also want to be going large as a bluff. So just keep, you know, keep filtering, keep looking through the list. Okay, well, what about something like 7-4 deuce, right? Let's look at the ranges. Um, same idea, like heavy, good, and weak hands here. Uh, it even has the disadvantage in this one, but mostly our range consists of the, the, uh, the good and the weak hands, like I mentioned, a little bit of the best hands, and some trash hands as well, but... Uh, not at a high frequency of the best in trash hands. It's mostly in this like condensed kind of uh, good hand range. So that's like another, you know, heuristic that you can apply for using like the 75 sizing at a high frequency. So boards where it's like hard for us to really whiff, right? We have a lot of medium strength hands uh, and our range can generally be happy betting at a larger sizing if we're going to bet. Um, so let's look at one last board, 983. And like I said, uh, since we have a mixed strategy of four different sizings, there's often a couple of sizings that are grouped in being used. So 125 and 75 is, is kind of the two choices for this board, 983. This is one of those boards that an overbet makes a lot of sense because we have a really strong top end of the range. And then we'll see here again, Look at how many good hands and weak hands we have. Very high frequency of good hands and weak hands. So we're starting to just find these heuristics, extract them, and then apply them in game, right? And so now I'm going to go through some like some really quick uh, scenarios that uh, we'll practice, and then we'll use everything we just learned and apply it to our study. All right, let me pull in to the trainer. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to take the trainer and study button versus big blind flop actually we can just do a custom spot let's take away the session we'll just do um the street or the spot And that looks good. Actually, let me change. There we go. So now we're the button. Oops. 
one second. Let's reset this button. Big blinds. There we go. All right, so now we're the button versus the big blind and we're thinking about betting. So learning everything we just kind of went over there, right? Oops. There we go. So putting together everything we just learned, a6-2, what kind of board is this? Well, this is one of those boards that, you know, we're going to have a lot of medium strength hands on, right? There's a big difference between the ace and the six. So we have a lot of middling cards. We're also going to have a lot of trash on this board. Um, what kind of, you know, we have some strong hands with the ace high, of course. Uh, we have some, some good hands with like the ace fives, like a hand like I have here. Uh, so I was talking about ways of like taking shortcuts uh, for thinking about our range. And a lot of people might, this might be a hot take or people might disagree, but I like to look at the hand that I have, right? Because at the end of the day, understanding what to do with a hand is a good thing. As long as you can think about some of the other hands in your range. If you're only thinking about um, the particular hand and doing that one thing every single time, you might be a bit unbalanced. But like, so for example, ace four, this is a hand typically I would check on this board at a high frequency because it's a medium strength hand. It doesn't make a lot of sense to overbet. It doesn't make a lot of sense to um, go really large uh, and try and go for three streets of value. So typically I'm going to uh, check this back or I'm going to bet small, right? Because the small bet kind of makes sense with like, you know, some kind of uh, other combos in our range. Like if we have queen nine suited or something like that, again, not really a board we want to want to be over betting on. So uh, I think uh, most of our range is going to be betting smaller. Uh, and it's also going to do some checking, a lot of checking. And this particular hand probably wants to mix between check and bet small. So that's how I put everything together after doing exactly what we were just doing earlier. And then I can double check that by studying the spot, right? Now, looking at the overall, uh, you know, pattern, it looks like the, the solver wants to check or bet small. Um, it does incorporate some 50% sizings because like we looked at uh, in the aggregated reports, the 50 kind of just groups up with the 33 because they're similar ideas, right? Like a smaller-ish sizing um, for the medium to stronger hands. Um, but overall, this is a board that we want to bet small on or uh, bet 50. Next board, 942, right? Like 942... Um, this is one of those boards we're going to have a pretty high range advantage on, right? We have all the over pairs. We have some of the strong nines. However, villain's going to have 4-2. They're going to have like 5-3 suited. They're going to have some more combos that interact with the 4-2 part of the board. So this board I could see mixing between a few different sizings. I could see, you know, using an over bet. I could see using a 75% bet. Um, I could also see using a 50% bet at, at maybe some frequency, probably not too much 33 sizing, um, and then a, a decent amount of checking mixed in. Now, what does this hand fall under? This is probably a trash hand. This is absolutely trash. Um, is this good for bluffing? Probably not. We don't have much equity on this board texture. Uh, we don't have a draw. We don't have any backdoors. We have one over card to the board. Um, this hand, I think, is just going to be happy to check or even mix in some large betting if the solver wants to throw it into our bluffing range. So I'm going to check with this one. And yeah, you can kind of see a check is a dominant option, uh, but the EV of the betting is all really close. You can even throw in an overbet uh, for the same EV as a 33 bet, right? Um, so yeah. And then if I wanted to go back, right, like I could go back and then I can look, well, what do we mostly want to do here? Was I right with betting uh, mostly large? Uh, yes. Most of the time, the solver wants to be betting large, 125 or 75. And like I said, it mixes in a little bit of the 50. Um, there is some 33 here, right? 
Uh, but in my mind, I'm probably going to simplify and take out at least one of the four sizings. Uh, although I do know that it is a possibility to use that sizing, it wouldn't be a mistake. So in my mind, when I'm randomizing and I'm using my randomizer here, I'm thinking I have four sizings. I'm going to uh, quarter off basically the randomizer. If I go for the... Um, the lower numbers, they're usually going to be the overbet sizing. If I go for the medium numbers, they're probably going to be in the middle sizing. And if I go for the high numbers, that isn't a check, then I'll use the 33 sizing. Uh, another board, very similar to the nine high board. Um, I think we want to be mostly be betting large. Uh, we could also mix in this 33 as we saw. This is a really good hand for betting flop. Uh, this is a pretty high roll though. Um, so I could see mixing check or betting 75 or 125. Uh, I'm going to check this time with this particular roll. I think I want to check or bet 33. Um, but overall, I think the hand wants to check or bet 75 and 125. So we're going to check. Yeah, so see, like most of the time, the solver wants to go larger uh, with this on the flop. Doesn't really overbet on the eight high board. I guess the nine is significant for making things a, a bit different. Um, queen seven four. Now this is a texture that again we have a lot of trash hands in the middle of the queen and seven. We have a lot of medium strength hands. I think we're going to mostly want to be betting uh, mid size or small size and check. I don't think we want to do a lot of overbetting here. Uh, we could probably mix in some seventy five percent, but this is a board I typically won't overbet on. Uh, villain can have queen seven, seven, four, et cetera. So I think this one wants to do a lot of checking. Uh, this is a good, you know, a good best hands hand that falls in the checking category. Doesn't want to go for three streets. We rolled really high. So I'm going to go for a check. Now we want to double check our, you know, want to double check our solution. Uh, there you go. The solver wants to bet small, medium, or check at a high frequency. Hardly ever over bets. 874. This is an interesting board. Um, huh. These are tricky boards, but I think let's take a look at it, right? Villain has a lot of strong hands on this board. This is a board that Villain could even perhaps do some leading on. We looked at some of the boards like that were good for leading for big blind, and they were all six, seven, and eight high, right? So this texture, I think, is probably going to overall be fairly bad for the button, um, which means we're going to want to do a lot of checking. And in terms of betting, it's going to be a mix of different things. I don't know if we have much of an overbet here. We rolled a really strong number. Um, overbet doesn't make a ton of sense because I don't think we have a really big best hands advantage. So I think the solver is going to want to range from 33 to 75, favoring check in 33. Because I rolled the two, I think 75 is an option. Um, we do have a hand that has some actual good backdoor equity, two overs, uh, backdoor flush draw. We have a nine for the eight and the seven. So I think we could bet 75 with this hand or 50. Uh, the solver is probably going to be pretty close to one of those sizings. Let's, let's try the 75. And there we go, right? So we have the 75 sizing. Like I said, most of the time the solver wants to check. And if we want to double check our um, you know, frequency, we can look at the spot. And I think I mentioned the solver is going to mix uh, uh, between, yeah. So most of the time, the solver is going to be mixing between small bet, 75 and 50 in check. Very little over bet. Um, again, that's, it's just tricky. <laughs> but uh, it does make some sense that we would have some over bets too because we have the nuts. We have uh, 8, 8, 7, 7. We have over pairs. We have all of the really strong hands. Um, I just wasn't sure at what frequency the solver would overbet. So this is a spot where I would learn something, right? Like, okay, I can have an overbet on an eight high board uh, that's connected. I just have to be careful uh, not to overdo it because it's a fairly low frequency overbet here. But the solver mainly wants to go 75, 50, or check. Um, and then it mixes in some of the 33 as well. So I think you guys get the idea. And uh, I hope you learned something from this, you know, 
the way that I look at everything and the way that I use all of GTA Wizards tools to study and to, to really extract all of the heuristics from the solver and uh, learn some game theory in the process, write down all of my conclusions and use all of the uh, tools like the training to verify anything that I do feel like I've learned or realized. All right, that's going to wrap up the uh, the video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.